to another enlightening episode of the Amrapal Africa podcast titled Climate Resilience, Safeguarding Kenya's Health with Amra. I'm Halima Sabwa and I'll guide you through today's journey into the heart of climate change and its profound impact on health outcomes in Kenya. As we witness the escalating effects of climate change globally, Kenya remains at the forefront, grappling with challenges that threaten the well-being of its communities. From droughts and floods to the emergence of climate-sensitive diseases, the need for comprehensive, resilient strategies has never been more critical. Today, we are honored to have with us distinguished experts making significant strides in the fight against climate-induced health crises. Joining us are Dr. Martin Ushangi, an expert in population health and environment at Amrap Health Africa in Kenya, and Sarah Koske, Program Manager for Public Health, Security, Climate Change and Health at Amrap Health Africa in Kenya. In this episode, we'll delve into the essential role of climate resilience in safeguarding the health of Kenyans. We'll discuss Amref Health Africa's innovative approaches to building sustainable and healthy communities capable of withstanding the adverse effects of climate change. Our guests will share their insights on the groundbreaking programs aimed at enhancing water security, promoting sustainable agriculture, and ensuring disease prevention through community-led actions. We'll hear compelling stories from the field, demonstrating the tangible impact of these efforts on improving lives and fostering resilience. Stay tuned as we navigate the challenges posed by climate change, the strategies employed to combat its effects on health, and the collaborative efforts needed to build a climate resilient Kenya. So uh, before we delve into our main topic, Sarah, if you could have any superpower to help you with your work at Amrap Health Africa, what would it be? Hmm, that's a good one. I, I, I think my superpower then will be angel of prevention. That way I'm able to detect early, prevent, and it makes Amrap's work easy because I mean, we are about uh, preventing diseases and making people thrive. And so if we could foresee that, protect, prevent, I think that would be my superpower. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Martin, Sarah talked about being the angel of prevention so that you know we can prevent a lot of crises that happen. So my question to you is, if you could choose an animal to be your personal mascot or symbol, what animal would it be and why? Oh my, <laughs> the angel of prevention. So now I don't think that I'm associated to the eagle, mm -hmm. largely because of its life strategies, the mm -hmm. survivorship strategies. Mm -hmm. the, the eagle is able to forecast, it has a very clear vision, and those are some of the key imperatives that you need in life to actually survive. Okay. And what do you think about the eagle, Sarah? I like that, and I, I, I guess it also goes with that eye view where you can already see things from very far and you can anticipate and start to put strategies together on how you want to execute. It, it makes a lot of sense, and I like it. Yeah. yeah. So awesome. you can imagine Angel of Prevention and the Eagle, Eagle together. together. <laughs> We're going to conquer. <laughs> That's yeah. very true. Yeah. yeah. So in Kenya, uh, we've been having a lot of problems with climate change in terms of people in Garissa not having access to food and other uh, commodities like uh, neonatal commodities and then coming to the uh, El Nino that we actually have just passed. So what does climate resilient mean to our listeners who might not fully grasp its significance? And could you just simplify that term in the context of Kenya's health sector? Yeah, climate resilience. I think resilience for any health system is that ability to be able to withstand and bounce back from a calamity. And so for climate in this aspect is we're looking at health systems that are actually able to respond even during climate crisis. And if anything happens to the health system, health facilities, then they are able to recover and that recovery and be able to provide services as required. And so this goes for the health system, the communities, and as you said, 
El Nino displaced so many people last year, and there was a time we had almost half a million of Kenyans living in camps because of flooding in northern Kenya. And that showed that sometimes you may not protect yourself from the calamity, but then how quickly can you bounce back? How quickly do we have now people who were in camps uh, December last year of 2023, and now we're in February, are they back to their households? Do they have their living, their, their, their livelihoods back? Mm -hmm. Are health facilities now rebuilt? Those ones that were flooded, have they come back and started to offer services? Mm -hmm. And so resilience is about, sometimes you get to be knocked down, but you don't stay down. You have to come back, rise above that, and continue to offer services to communities. That's excellent, because resilience, the ability to withstand and bounce back. So when you get hit, you get right back up, Absolutely. which also comes with the provision of healthcare services mm -hmm. and the ability for health systems in Kenya to recover. Absolutely. So based on that, Martin, in the context of AMREF Health Africa in Kenya, what do you identify as critical elements for building climate resilience in Kenyan communities? Yeah, thank you. So. AMREF has been implementing a couple of cross-functional uh, programs that first of all aim at preventing uh, diseases and at the same time actively treating uh, several conditions. But there are some key elements that we've been so keen and very, very categorical on ensuring that they are implemented. So the first element is that AMREF ensures that we work with the communities and we ensure that the community's uh, voices uh, are actually a part and parcel of what we use in terms of programming. The second piece is that we work very closely with the governments. And uh, through our work with the government, we ensure that policies, strategies, and uh, you know, operating procedures are founded within uh, an institutional framework which can ensure sustainability. Then the third piece is that we bring forth innovative programs uh, that are novel, that ensure that we are trying to beat um, traditional methods which are perhaps not as efficient as what we advance. We move forward to couple that with partnerships. We take partnerships very, uh, you know, um, seriously, ensuring that we bring multiple strengths onto the table. So. In totality, AMREV has been uh, working in a couple of um, programming areas which cross cut between HIV, TB, malaria, that is more or less of infectious diseases, and communicable diseases as well. And now, more specifically, the issues around climate change and health, which is something we, that is new to us, perhaps, uh, so to speak. And we got into this space because we realized that whatever gains we were getting uh, out of our previous interventions were getting eroded. Yeah. And I think to add to that, because in the essence of building that resilient health system, mm -hmm. and especially for climate, is the early warning systems. Mm -hmm. Because if you know in advance that it's going to happen, then you're better prepared to, 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 to handle it and to respond to it. So early warning systems and also capacity building. Sometimes we just assume that people know, yeah. but it's important to continuously build capacities for both the community, but also the health workforce, because then they're the ones at the front line. And so they need to have the ammunition to actually protect themselves from these calamities. And that's very true, Martin and Sarah, because when you're looking at cross cutting sections. You're looking at how to build a holistic solution to climate change Absolutely. and to build climate resilience. And specifically when we're talking about capacity building, I think that's one of the most important parts of this entire thing. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, Sarah said it very well. And actually the question is, why do we always draw to our small corners and start addressing things to do with the environment, things to do with animals, things to do with human health, while we know very well that all this is connected mm -hmm. and there's a lot of benefits if we came together to address it. Yeah. And so AMREF is doing a lot of work in terms of trying to break those barriers and we've started getting it right. Right now we have programs which are being implemented in the northern parts of Kenya with major successes. But the question is, 
do we have national policies which recognize and promote one health philosophy the way it's supposed to be? Because if we do that, I tend to think that we are going to start seeing uh, better fruits and you know major progress in terms of addressing climate change and health. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And actually beyond the policies is the implementation of it all. Yeah. So you could have very nice policies on paper, but mm -hmm. then if we don't set aside resources to actually implement that, then it becomes null and void. But before we get ahead of ourselves, <laughs> we've talked about One Health, we've talked about these diseases that can afflict Kenyans, like yellow fever and rabies, etc., that are zoonotic in nature. That being said, but from your perspective, Dr. Martin, how do climate resilience efforts contribute to improving health outcomes and health accessibility, especially in vulnerable communities? Exactly. So a couple of things, and I will just pick it from where Sarah uh, uh, left it. Sarah spoke about capacity building. Sarah spoke about early warning systems, having very clear early warning systems that are responsive to the impacts of climate change. But just to really deepen that, there's something which we have to get right here. Sometimes we normally have so much health leaning data that is not corroborated or cross tabulated with the climate data. So the kind of picture which comes to the tables is just in describing uh, occurrence of diseases without appreciating the drivers of that. So at the end of the day, it will be really nice to bring the ministries of health, ministries of environment to start speaking to each other, build a strong database that can then inform um, early warning systems that are authentic and responsive to the changing climate. Then the other issue is around research. Yeah, we have major gaps. And I know one of the key things is that whereas we know that climate is actually affecting the uh, health of human beings, there is a major gap in terms of micron data. So for example, that person who is in Mandela now, how is the climate change affecting them at that level? You know, that data is absent. So we need to encourage a lot of research to go on, bring that authentic data, and that is the only way we are going to start programming progressively. In addition, there's a whole field of listening to the people. Uh, it's called citizen science. Listen to the communities. Uh, climate change, Sarah said, is not a new phenomenon. It was experienced earlier on, but our local communities had some information on how to go about providing local solutions. So citizen science coupled with empirical science, then bringing that together is going to give us a very good picture about what needs to be done when. Yeah. That's excellent, especially when talking about data is one of our new uh, parts mm -hmm. of our strategy, looking at data-driven science, because data-driven science then gives you proper um it gives you a proper state of what's happening on the ground and using citizen science and empirical science is is important for that end but i feel at the end of the day um having african solutions for african problems or kenyan solutions for kenyan problems really stands out because if a community has traditional ways that they've been dealing with changes in climate they should be incorporated into the empirical science and data so that we can have again holistic data that actually gives solutions to the people and based on that uh, Sarah, what do you feel are the main challenges in fostering climate resilience in Kenyan communities? And how is AMREF addressing those hurdles? I don't want to sound like a dooms person because there is <laughs> quite a lot because I think it takes a lot also to protect our, 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 our environment, to protect ourselves. And climate is a global thing. And so you can imagine because it's global, then also challenges are that huge. But just to mention a few is what we've already spoke about. The extreme climate events is one thing that even hinders our work and also hinders uh, climate resilience because you build a system and then it's taken down by 
floods, for example, or, or, or drought. And, and then the other challenge is the resources. We've, talk, we've talked about having policies in place, we've talked about having guidelines, and also just knowing what you need to do. But all this is nothing if we actually do not put um, resources to it to be able to implement. The other challenge would be the vulnerabilities at community level, because you'll find that aside from uh, climate events, already our communities are vulnerable from many things. There is diseases, there is lack of access to, to education, even schools to get a school, you have to go very far to get to a health uh, to a school to get to a health facility you also have to walk the distance for example to get a health facility it's even made worse now when you have climate uh, crisis and people are going without food food insecurity is cropping up and so you choose between uh, should i even go to hospital should i go look for water first and so such challenges are the ones that are making it really difficult for us to uh, for communities to prosper and to improve their their well-being and I agree with you because I feel like uh, mothers and children are the ones that are being impacted the most by climate change. Especially now if you're breastfeeding as a mother, you don't have the milk. Yeah. And then you, don't, you, you have to make the choice, am I going to take my child to hospital or am I going to go and fetch water for the household? Mm. Um, exactly. And also boys and young men and mm. fathers are being affected. Because mm. if you live somewhere in Garissa, you have the choice. Mm. Am I going to take my camels to the water hole that's 20 miles away? Mm. Or am I going to stay at home and try and help um, my wife and my child? And also, you know, there are also these cultural um, things. Mm. It's not a man's job to stay at home and to help with household. I have to go. Mm -hmm. and I have to go and fetch water. Mm -hmm. So there are so many different aspects to look at and challenges when you're looking at climate change and building resilience in Kenya. That's very true. Yeah, so true. Based on everything that we've talked about, I have a question for uh, you, Sarah. How does MF ensure that climate resilience measures reach the most vulnerable communities? Because as we were talking about meeting the needs of communities where they are, different communities have different needs. So in Garissa, it might be malnutrition. In, in Vihiga, it might be malaria. In Nairobi, it could be cholera. So how does AMREF ensure that climate resilience measures reach the most vulnerable communities? And what impact has these solutions had? A lot. And, and, and I think you know, as AMREF, we've been working to strengthen communities for decades yes. and communities are at the core of everything that we do. And so to ensure that we actually reach the last mile is making use of those community owned resource persons. These include community health promoters and we've seen the government prioritizing also supporting community health promoters because they are the agents of change. They are the people who actually are known as the village doctors. And so this is a group that can you can a low hanging fruit and you can reap a lot if you work with community health promoters, train them and also give them the resources and facilitate them to be able to reach those households at that level. Aside from community health promoters, is schools. Show me a sub county that does not have school. Show me a household that has not have a, a child. And we've seen that children are actually agents of change as well. If they go washing hands at in school, they'll go back home and say, I cannot eat before I wash my hands. After the toilet, I have to wash my hands. We were told to eat balanced diet, and you will see parents actually just listening to that and communities emulating that. So schools is another entry point. The other um, group is also the citizen science that Martin has mentioned, and working with communities at that level we, we, for example, have uh, what we call multi-stakeholder innovation platforms within the projects that we are running. And these are communities that come together and do community dialogues. And so they discuss what is the pressing need. It could be something outside climate. It could be just the basic uh, services that they get at the health facility. It could be a nurse who is disrespectful to mothers and so they don't want to go back to that facility because then they are treated badly. So those community dialogues discusses that and scales it up to people who can make 
um, decisions and improve services for them. So looking at working in such organized groups, women groups is it, it cannot. I mean, the, the the power of women groups cannot be under un, un, understated because then this happens everywhere, and it's it's because of our social culture. People always come together. So working with such groups, we are able, we are assured of reaching the last mile. That's yeah. really good. And the thing that I really liked about your answer was the one about schools, because teaching children about climate change, about NTDs, actually, Martin, you talked about um, Akili Kids and using yeah. that as a platform to tell them about um, NTDs. Yeah. Yes. So. <clears throat> That's an amazing because you know you are right, Sarah. They are champions of change. So if your child is coming to you and they're saying, "I'm not going to wash, I'm not going to eat food until I wash my hands," yeah. it's going to send a message to the parents, and that's something now that they'll take on in their household, yeah. and then that can even proliferate further into different aspects of that community, mm -hmm. from just educating one child about these things. We've even seen, uh, especially around food security and yeah. nutrition, where in the school children are taught about having a small kitchen garden. Mm -hmm. And so each child is given a, a, a bucket or, or a sack. Yeah. And you're told put um, soil in it, and then plant your spinach, plant your uh, skuma wiki. Mm -hmm. And every child will be having that and guarding that. A long time ago, I think we had very active uh, 4K clubs which were being implemented in school. And so you'll find this child will go back home and have a similar sack. Mm -hmm. with spinach, uh, with vegetables, and they are really proud of it. Mm -hmm. And that way, one, they will have food and they will have something to say, I learned this in school, and the parents will realize that this sack can actually give us vegetables for mm -hmm. the household. And that happens with kitchen gardens, and you, people will get their basic nutrition from that. Mm -hmm. I'm and actually doing it myself. See? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Grow your own food, yeah. especially yeah. now when we are grappling yeah. with food safety. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's sustainable farming at, at the grassroots. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. and we assume that this only happens in the village. Yeah. Yeah. It actually even happens in, 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 in our balconies in yeah. Nairobi. Yes. Because now you, you're no longer trusting that um, a mamboga, uh, uh, the scuba wiki that is being sold outside yes. your gate mm -hmm. because you don't know where it's coming from. Was mm -hmm. it planted in the sewage somewhere? So you feel safer to have your own small garden mm -hmm. and protect yourself and have safe food. And you know what you're putting into your food because you've grown it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what pesticides that you're using. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about, we've already briefly touched on strategic partnerships. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that is really dear to my heart because we've launched the 2023-2030 strategy mm -hmm. and climate change is a huge part of that strategy. Yeah. So what are AMREF Health Africa's climate resilience initiatives mm -hmm. and how do they work with strategic partnerships? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much. I think, first of all, climate change language can be very complicated. And I don't like to use these uh, complicated ones like uh, climate adaptation mm. and climate mitigation. What it simply means is that when you're talking about adaptation, climate change is with us here. So what are these actions that each and every one of us is supposed to do or to take to ensure that we live with the impacts of climate change? And those are the things which we have actually discussed very well here. It is ensuring that we have proper food production. It is ensuring that our water services are actually safeguarded. We, we are ensuring that the resilience is attained for our health facilities and all that. Then there's the other part, which is the climate change mitigation, which is answering the question of how do we prevent ourselves from continuing to create further damage by reducing the amount of greenhouse gases uh, that are emitted. So Africa is largely uh, leaning towards adaptation. Adaptation is like, this is the impacts which are here, and we have to live with them. So basically, looking at the partnerships that we have been uh, engaging with, I would basically say that, uh, first of all, we are involved in strategic uh, relationship 
between the ministries of health and the ministries of environment, and that is at the national level. We are part and parcel of the conversation that is happening at that level, just to ensure that these two sectors come together and start forging some uh, actions which can join conjointly address uh, their problems. And this is quite founded from the regional level. I remember in the year 2008, ministers of health and environment met at Ngapong and they signed into a document called the Libra Building Declaration on Health and Environment. So that set pace between strategic alliance uh, between the ministries of health and the ministries of environment. Now the question is, how has that journey morphed? And is it achieving the commitments which were made? I think there is a question there and we all need to work towards strengthening that uh, initiative. Then when you come to um, the donor community, I know we are working very closely with the Rockefeller Foundation, the Wellcome Trust Foundation, and all these donors have their particular um, uh, interest where they are funding, you know. So like Wellcome Trust is so keen on ensuring that we have the information and the data that is needed to address climate change and health uh, impacts. Rockefeller Foundation is so keen to ensure that we have the innovations and the best by solutions that then, if implemented, uh, will address the climate change and uh, health issues. At the end of the day, we are working very closely with universities. And you know, our own university, uh, AMREF uh, International University, has actually moved forward to send set a center for policy and research on climate change and health. What that one means is that we are now connecting the new knowledge that comes from academia to the practice and actually translating it into policy work. So that's, that's the other kind of partnership that we are forging very strongly. Above all, if you leave out the community, as we say, and making sure that they are the, at the center, looking at the youth, looking at the children, looking at the women, looking at the men, wherever they are best found, uh, we are working to answer that and ensuring that their voices are heard and we support them in their best elements to address these issues of climate change and health. That's very true because I do agree that in Kenya, we are more reactive versus proactive. Yeah. We are like, okay, this is where we are right now. This is our space. And this is how we are going to mitigate these um, climate change uh, problems that we are having. But we should be more proactive. And I like that uh, through donors and through academia, they're actually giving us a roadmap so that we can solve some of our problems and actually reverse some of the effects of climate change, because that's very important. And also, I think if I remember correctly, it's only 2%. We only contribute 2% of the global carbon emissions. 4% in 4%, Africa, yes. yeah, but it is expected to go up yes. if we continue this way, because our population is growing. Mm. Yeah, and so we are likely to continue emitting more as we develop, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, but that needs to be cut because Africa is not short of green energy solutions. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. So, Sarah, what are your thoughts on climate change and Amar Health Africa's strategy in terms of climate change solutions? There's no better time than now. And I think that was also the realization when we were crafting the 2023 2030 strategy for AMREF. Because then we keep saying our vision is for lasting health change. How then do you achieve lasting health change if these, these interactions by climate? And so uh, what I view is that if we actually act on the things that we've mentioned earlier from capacity building to partnerships, to water security, food security, we should be able to move the needle towards lasting health change. And the thing is, uh, we understand as AMREF that it's not a competition. We all need to come together to be able to serve our communities for better well-being. And so partnerships is also very core to what we do. And you've seen it even from uh, our generic work in, in primary health care, but also now on One Health. 
more than ever is because then we realize the power of coming together as organizations and serving the communities to the best ability we can. And that's very true because there's this saying, together you go, no, alone you go far, but together we go even farther. Something like that. I don't that. know if that's how it goes. It's just <laughs> how it goes. <laughs> But yes, together we go further, definitely, yeah. very yeah. fast. Yeah. Yeah. Doing it as an individual. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and it saves us resources yes. because exactly. instead of duplicating and doing the same thing, reinventing the wheel, mm -hmm. why can't we learn from those who've gone before us or those who've already tested a methodology mm -hmm. and say, hey, let's do it this way. It's not like we are, we are competing. And so it's all for the good and for the benefit mm -hmm. of the communities. Mm -hmm. And that's very true. Yeah. That's very true. As we wrap up today's discussion on climate resilience, safeguarding Kenya's health with AMREF, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to our guests, Dr. Martin Mushangi and Sarah Koske, for sharing your profound knowledge and experiences. Their dedication shines a light on the intricate relationship between climate change and health and the critical steps AMREF Health Africa is taking to fortify the resilience of Kenyan communities against environmental threats. Today's conversation has not only highlighted innovative strategies and programs that AMREF Health Africa in Kenya employs, but also underscored the spirit of collaboration and community engagement, which is vital for building a sustainable future. Their efforts are a beacon of hope demonstrating the power of collective action in overcoming challenges posed by climate change. For those inspired by our journey into climate resilience and health, we invite you to connect with us through our social media platforms, which are Twitter, AMREF underscore Kenya, Facebook at AMREF KE, and Instagram hashtag AMREF Kenya. I'm Halima Sabwa, and it's been a privilege to bring this critical conversation to you. Let's continue to work together, fostering resilience and health for all Kenyans. Thank you for tuning in, and goodbye for now. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>